So, um, first of all, a little bit about me. I'm uh, a clarinetist. Uh, I also play bass clarinet. Um, I've been a performer for about 20 years now. Um, I used to be based in London, now I'm based in Edinburgh. And recently started a uh, create practice research-based PhD in uh, Edinburgh looking at um, practice in live electronic performance and theorizing about liveness and interaction, all those usual things. Um, I'm moving, I suppose my, my presentation today, first of all, I apologize, I didn't bring clarinet, I was going to do that for my break up there. The, the, the speaking, um, but in fact it's just impractical and at the time I think it's much better if I speak and um, maybe, play, maybe play some music uh, if we get time. Um, so, um, I'm going to examine requirements of a performer in managing issues of synchronicity, audio input and output, peripheral vision, cueing, trust and particularly attention within an interactive environment. Um, at a performance earlier this year at the Dialogues Festival in Edinburgh, and this was my um, first performance moving from what I call a kind of astronaut model for a musician where you, you learn your part and you just get plugged in by the te technicians, the composer sits at the computer and, and runs the electronics. So I moved from this kind of, um, this, this kind of astronaut model to, to I'm moving towards uh, where, where applicable and where practical and where desirable and on stage control of all the electronics and just giving the outputs to the sound engineer. And the reason uh, that a musician would want to do this, of course, we spend years working our sound and, and or our sounds, uh, and um, we get very uh, personal and very bespoke about our equipment. And it seems to me that this is, uh, uh, for somebody who wants to do more live electronic performance, this is a really important thing um, that we take the concept of our sound and we integrate it with the electronics and, and, and use that in, in the same way that we do, to the same degree of precision that we do our instruments. So I, I played this concert and I presented, this was my first outing as an on-stage control thing. So um, my presentation today is very much work in progress and I appreciate feedback as well as questions and suggestions. Um, I presented three works for clarinet and computer, uh, one written, two improvised, and each I felt engendered a sense of interactive play in both the performer and the audience. So I'll examine the communication of the material for each piece since it's a notation workshop as it was presented by the composer. So firstly, by a combination of text description, on-screen prompts, and a GUI. Secondly, by a traditional notation with the aid of a guide stave with electronics, cue numbers, and a sound file for testing and rehearsal. And finally, uh, in, the, in the third piece, by standalone application. In each case, I was very fortunate to work in close personal contact with the composers, uh, which afforded the significant benefit of discourse and uh, contextualization. So it's been observed by um, people like Sebastian Baerbeck, for example, uh, uh, in his PhD thesis, that software interfaces for live electronic performance have tended, on the whole, to be designed uh, by, uh, for use by composers or technicians. Um, the user-adapted presentation mode in Max MSP uh, 6 provides an opportunity for us musicians to adapt and personalize our visual material in a way that which is really common with, with paper scores. Now, um, when I get a score from a composer, I usually end up printing it out, and what I tend to do is use a pencil um, and manage all sorts of issues to do with, um, first of all, maybe resizing it because I'm getting old and I'm a little bit uh, long sighted, uh, as many musicians are. I um, might reformat it. I had a, a score which uh, came through beautifully printed on, on landscape uh, format, and I didn't like that, and I found it very difficult to manage the page turns. So uh, start that together into, you know, um, maybe into portrait. Uh, we use pencil markings, of course, text. Uh, instructions which help us with timing and dynamics. Color highlights, particularly for electronic cueing, if you're pedaling or looking at cues. Um, th these are all things that we do, um, and we don't really think about it because that's the way we present. We, we personalize our material on our music stands as on some play it. Um, so yeah, I sometimes even I've gone as far as you know getting into Sibelius and renotating things that I don't like and harmonically I don't like the way it's laid out, uh, and all of that serves. Um, on the day of the performance, 
and in rehearsal to make me more comfortable and for my attention to be, to be managed in an efficient way because humans have CPU problems as well, right? We, need, we, we don't want too much, of our, too much of our attention taken up by irrelevances. Um, so I, I'll take the, each case uh, in turn. The first piece that I presented was, um, well, I, actually, yeah, before I do that, here's an example of the kind of uh, interface score that we might get uh, through, sent through by a composer. And this is definitely what I would call composer or technician oriented. Um, so there's actually, it's actually quite neat, um, uh, but on the whole, you know, at a distance of, of, of a meter and a half, um, that, that's, that's pretty complicated and pretty, uh, pretty useless for me as a, as a kind of, as a kind of performance or difficult, not useless, but difficult. Um, and certainly if I showed that to a colleague who was uh, looking at playing, uh, this piece is a, very much a kind of entry level first piece that you might play with electronics, it's short and it's accessible, but certainly I, would, I wouldn't call this interface uh, accessible. I'll come on to that because it's the second piece. Uh, and I'll show you what I did with that. Um, the first piece, Andrew May, Ripped Up Maps, is an improvisation for, for any instrument and computer. It has a score of musical and text instructions, a graphical interface in Max MSP, and on-screen resumes of both the software and the score instructions are optionally available in the display. Here's the material I was sent through. One of the problems encountered in the original interface was that of constantly flickering floating point numbers up in these uh, tracks, level, and pitch displays. So they're constantly moving. And uh, so I had to get rid of that. I didn't want that. That's, that's the equivalent of be, you know, if, if I'm here and the stopwatch is constantly going, just in my peripheral vision, it's going to be very distracting. It actually takes a lot of your attention. So I don't want to see that. Um, and it got me thinking, well, what else do I not want to see and what else do I not need to see? Um, this view is really well designed for setup and the outsized toggle boxes numbered one to four indicate the states of the piece and those are clear at close viewing. Most performers prefer placing their computer slightly to the side rather than face on and when standing a meter or more away from even a large display like this one, uh, the combination of distance and peripheral vision acutely reduces the impact of these really important states in the piece. So, therefore, I chose to further enlarge the boxes and color them distinctly one from the other. I used rather garish colors, and any designers in the room will be probably quite upset by that. But I wanted them to be as different as possible. My adaptive presentation mode here in Mac 6 provides enhanced visual feedback, clearly registered from a distance, of up to about two meters from the screen, and achieved it with these blocks of distinct color and large format graphics on an anti-glare background. I don't like having a white screen because on stage the lights are quite low and I tend to get this kind of pasty glow coming up from underneath. It's not terribly flattering. It's also, it's also kind of odd you know, and unnecessary. Um, the state changes and sample pedal slider were also magnified because these are very significant. Um, perhaps more important during a performance of this interactive piece <coughs> are the um, ver are vertically expanded control pedal box, which originally was, was like this. So I need to see that very clearly where I am because the states are uh, adapt very much to the use of the, of, the, um, of the expression pedal there. And I put in a larger, more distinctive mute a uh, toggle box, which also serves as audio safety. Well, I also use an analog device uh, in case you're worried, um, or just a vol uh, volume knob. Um, but it's, it's handy to have that kind of emergency mute there. Max 6 currently provides an either or model for patching or presentation purposes, which I suggest could be expanded in subsequent updates to offer several views to the user. For example, here a GUI which provided only the actual performance information that I needed while playing could be really useful. Once the pieces keep ready, just the state boxes, the control and sample pedals, and maybe the mute button. Um, a further suggestions for this piece might be that I could investigate the influence of color and optimize the use of color. The colors should probably match in the. Uh, you, you don't see the colors should probably match. 
these colors used in the text instructions for a, for a new user. Um, we could use um, iPad mirroring to avoid this kind of having a display over here uh, and, and just have a kind of a music stand situation where you're looking straight on. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, multiple presentation modes for Mac 6. The second piece uh, I chose to play was by a longtime uh, colleague and friend of mine, Richard Dudas. Um, and it's a transcription of a piece he wrote for flute. Uh, and we've, we've written about this process of transcription uh, elsewhere, um, which is quite interesting in the context of electronic music. But uh, we're here to talk about notation, so I'll stick to that for now. A traditionally noted, notated score is used for the piece with numbered cues, some of which have been repositioned slightly to provide accuracy and reassurance. Cue 1, for example, was moved at my suggestion to the very beginning of the piece. It's a silent cue, so there's no output in the electronics. But here it serves to provide valuable feedback to the musician that the system is listening. Uh, otherwise, there's a period of about 10 to 12 seconds before any such feedback is given. You, you don't know it's working until you get to think 3. Uh, so, or letter A, in fact, in that, um, uh, as you can see on there. Uh, this issue of trust is, is analogous to an orchestral cue from a conductor, which uh, rather than is, has much more to do with communication and collaboration and trust than just synchronicity and specific functionality. I, I've counted the bar's rest, I know where to come in. Um, the cue from the conductor is just a kind of reinsurance. And so we get this, this business of trust between the computer and the musician, which I think is really important. Uh, the original patch, here it is again, was sent through. It's a good example of, of, a, uh, of a composer or technician oriented interface. So I went through several versions of a new presentation mode resulting in the current work in progress model here. Patch cords are no longer visible and everything, especially the text for both setup and running the piece has been enlarged and ordered into task groups instructions, settings, input, levels, cues, and then items relating to the score follower, which is used for the electronic, triggering the electronics in this piece. Um, MIDI control pedal, uh, again, connection was made for the global output from the patch in order to control nuanced dynamics and shape some entries uh, and to bring the total output down to zero at the end of the piece, because otherwise it would stay open. So there was quite a lot to do there, and, um, but I think you'll agree it's a lot more organized and for an entry level uh, interface of somebody who's not done a lot of electronic music, this is a lot, this is a lot less daunting than the one than we originally saw and is a lot more logical in its flow. It's still a work in progress and we could do with um, some <coughs> further, further suggestions that I would have would be to improve the cue list uh, for rehearsal purposes. I, I would like the slider to read in treble clef only because that's what we're used to and I, I, you know, a clarinet is not necessarily used to reading in, in, in treble clef. Incidentally, we I changed this to um, adapt to this and I, I, I altered the, um, the slider to read in B flat because I didn't want to transpose again while I'm, while I'm playing. That gives me, uh, that's going to be uh, you know, too much CPU. Very quickly, because I have about a minute, I'm going to whiz through my, a third piece, Martin Parker's Grunt Count. Now this, um, this piece is uh, an attempt to address issues of contingency and spontaneity within a composed framework, uh, and it's presented as a standalone application. I think it's a really good uh, uh, example of, uh, the, the, these are elements to do the piece which I'm not going to have to rush through, but it, it, one works with Martin and he creates bespoke settings for you. Um, there's no time, I'm afraid, to, to, to listen to it, but then you go to my website, there's, a, there's an example of this. Uh, on the MP3 player. Um, this is the interface that it provides. The non-linear -linear timeline uh, here running across um, is pushed to left, from left to right by the performer and will come to a halt when you're silent or play under a set threshold. So this gives us a pleasing degree of control over the overall timing and pacing and flow of the piece and creates moments of suspension in the electronics when you're static. So this is where the drama lies with the 
and the kind of illusion of interactivity in this essentially reactive piece, which uh, you know pervades the performance. Um, the y-axis represents um, the different settings which are numbered, so for example 26 rhythmically or 27 or this one, uh, and they're subdivided into hundreds so that you can create a nuanced and dynamic flow within the electronics. Um, so uh, uh, this is another example of a different curve, um, and I, th I suggest in the questions afterwards and in, and, in, and in private conversation you want to know more about this piece. Uh, you come and ask me, but that may be for another time, so we're running out of time. Um, in conclusion, I'll go through this. Uh, these further suggestions are very similar to the previous pieces, but Martin's actually thought an awful lot about this interface, so I was very happy with it. Um, in conclusion, the alterations I've outlined are all aspects of interface design that have been long advocated by people like Todd Winkler going back to the 90s, but they can be overlooked for reasons of time and a lack of concern for third part usability, particularly for entry level players. And with an increasing number of us looking to choose, uh, choosing to move forwards to complete on stage control, a more nuanced approach to good practice and innovation interface design and notation, I think, is to be encouraged. Uh, in a move to what uh, Alex McLean, Dan Stoll, have asked for uh, expressive higher order music notations, and I think this is part of the process. And further, lastly, further experience with all three pieces will in fact reduce uh, one's reliance on the visual interface. Uh, Andrew May in fact often performs his piece without reference to the GUI and relies entirely on familiar familiarity with the sounds of each state. It should be stressed, I think, that this is potentially the ideal manner in which to perform these works, um, and, and it's akin to memorizing a written score. However, it requires significantly more time than is often available. Um, and certainly the changes I've outlined here, outlined here serve a purpose as an aid to rehearsal and private practice for a musician. Thanks. Thanks.